Um, good morning. Can I welcome uh, you to this, the seventh meeting of 2013 of the European and External Relations Committee and make the usual request that all electronic devices be switched off for the broadcast and people won't be very happy. Uh, moving on to agenda item one, which is a decision to take agenda item six in private. And I'm um, asking Agreed. my colleagues if they agree. Yeah, OK. Agenda item two is uh, moving on to our foreign language uh, learning inquiry and primary schools. And uh, one of our committee members, Helen Eady, will give a brief feedback of the visit that she attended in, is it Johnny Bristol Primary School? Bristol, yeah. Yes. Um, so, so, Helen, if, if, if you would uh, give us your, your brief overview of your oh, visit. Okay, thanks. thanks very much, Kibina. Yes, it was a very welcome, although belated, visit. I think we're quite late in the programme of, of visits to schools, but um, we were very pleased to meet with, I thought, enthusiastic teachers. We captured uh, with them the fact that they were uh, very uh, encouraged by um, the prospects of there being uh, you know, increased uh, developments in this particular area. And of course, the school it has a high proportion of teachers who were trained under the Modern Languages and Primary School Initiative in French and German. And they uh, highlighted that a significant period of time had elapsed since this training for some of them. And uh, some of the teachers, like many schools across Scotland, are not MLPS trained, but teach languages nevertheless, because they have that expertise. And like other evidence that we've heard in committee, they also, um, you know, there's, there's been an issue of continuity from primary to secondary school. Uh, although this school has not experienced any problems of transition for the children who wish to carry on with their language training when they moved from uh, secondary school. Although they did mention that local uh, secondary school may move, move its emphasis to Spanish. Previously, I think when my daughters were at that school, it was German and French that they, they had taught there. It's interesting to note um, that because the, that language isn't taught at the primary school, so clearly that's a, an issue. And the teachers noted that there was a great variation in the, the levels of the language skills amongst the primary schools in their cluster uh, that feed into the local secondary school. And they found it frustrating that pupils with more advanced knowledge from Dunne Bristol uh, could be held back uh, by those from other schools with uh, lesser abilities. And I take it that that's probably an issue that you know, applies right across Scotland as well in other examples. And the local secondary school did have an arrangement to allow a specialist languages secondary teacher to work with Donny Bristol pupils, which uh, everyone found uh, very helpful. Yeah. Um, the teachers uh, did highlight particular uh, issues for them, and that was that in their local authority, they, uh, in recent years, um, the local authority had uh, began a policy of composite classes. Um, to save resources, which had made uh, the class teaching much more challenging for them. And the foreign language students had uh, assisted uh, the language teachers in previous years, which teachers had found to be very uh, beneficial. So that was a helpful point that they'd had. And the language, languages were taught with a level of immersion. For example, Primary 7 had created a French cafe when students studying the topic of food and teachers thought that the immersion technique was important and more purposeful and effective. I think we've heard that in evidence that we've had from other witnesses here, um, but was um, challenged in this overcrowded cur curriculum that they um, you know, felt that was an issue for them. The Donny Bristol teachers liked a model used in Canada where, where teachers could take one year out in every five years to work abroad and learn new skills and travel. Pay, pay was uh, overall uh, lower um, and the pay for as four years pay was spread over five years and I thought that was a, a, an interesting um, example that they highlighted for us. Um, however, the Donny Bristol teachers felt that this was more than compensated for by the ability to recharge and learn new skills in that year off because, as we know, everyone has a possibility of burnout, especially in the teaching profession and some of the more intense professions. 
and it would appear that that was uh, something that they felt uh, was very interesting and, and would like to see it developed here, I think. They also supported a pilot of introducing Latin in another Scottish school on the basis that this would encourage learning of language structure. I think that they said that this was one of the uh, languages that um, really, you know, so many other uh, foreign languages across Europe has a, a root in Latin. And then the input from the community, um, they felt that parents didn't have a great input into languages, classes, unlike the examples I think that you convened when you did your visit, but were involved in other types of classes that often helped in promoting cultural events such as uh, Diwali or the Chinese New Year. And there were a wide range of national languages represented by the school pupils and the parents, including uh, Polish, Russian, Hungarian, Norwegian, Mexican, Urdu and Welsh, as well as Scottish. And the teacher said that the parents often discouraged children from speaking their mother tongue if it was not English, as they believed that speaking English was more important. And, um, you know, from, from my uh, perspective, I, I discussed the Scottish Government's uh, one plus two language proposals with the teachers who thought it would have a great impact on what training was provided, especially to new teachers. Teachers thought that trained teachers delivering their own language class was a more effective way of language teachers than a peripatetic specialist, as per permanent teachers would have a better knowledge of their class and raised the issue of the EU funding and the teachers thought that knowledge of EU funding, funded opportunities was usually acquired randomly. There was no systematic approach you know, through a universal approach. So I think, Minister, that's maybe something to feed back to the Scottish Government because it is an issue. They were not aware of information from the British Council. One teacher had been on an EU-funded visit to France due to the opportunity being highlighted by Le Francais on a course on a teacher training course. She described the application form as difficult and had given up a week of her holidays to go so that the school did not have a problem of backfilling her post. So I thought that was really helpful, um, that visit. And although it was uh, late on in um, the programme of visits, I, I felt it was very useful. And thank uh, particularly Jenny Goldsmith for coming with me and, and helping me in the visit. So thank you, convener. Okay, thanks very much. Any questions for Helen? Lily? Thanks. I was going to ask, Helen, did the school use any particular uh, IT um, equipment and software to assist the teaching of languages? They didn't show us any, and I don't recollect them talking about it, um, but I'm sure that it's one of these things that maybe it just didn't come up in the conversation. If it was of special interest for you, we could always make contact with the school and ask them again if you felt that that was something you wanted to know, Willie. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? No. Can I thank you for your feedback, Helen? It's, it's very valuable, and although you're saying it's, it's, it's sort of a late in the inquiry, I think it's still uh, very valuable to hear that because we've got different sort of a patchworks across the country of different bits of information um, that schools have and have not got, and it's, uh, it's good to see that. Uh, and, and, and incorporate that into the, the recommendations that we'll, that we'll make. Thanks very much. I, mean, I think they were enthusiastic, but just you know, recognised the challenges yeah. that were there. Okay, thank you. Um, happy to move on to agenda item three. Yeah. Okay, agenda item three is again our foreign languages and uh, learning in primary schools inquiry, and um, we are delighted to have uh, our, on our panel today um, the. Dr Alistair Allen, who's the Minister for Learning, Science and Scottish Languages. And, and I could see your brows knitting together, Minister, when uh, you were hearing about uh, the teaching of Scots. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll hear something from you on that. Um, can I also welcome uh, uh, the, the Minister's supporting officials, Tim Simons, who's the head of the Curriculum Unit, and Sue Langlands, who's the head of Languages Team, Curriculum Unit for the Scottish Government. Um, I think we're going to go straight into questions, unless, uh, Minister, you've got um, a, somebody first have... to say. Yep, yep. Happy, happy to take that, yep. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the committee for the, the opportunity to be here today um, and to talk about learning and, and teaching of languages in Scotland's schools. Uh, I'm aware that your inquiry has received a, a great deal of interest and a great deal of comment indeed as well in the media and beyond. And I'd just like to say I'm pleased about that um, because uh, needless to say in, in the world that we live in, uh, the importance of languages can't be, uh, uh, can't be uh, underestimated. I'm somebody who has personally quite an interest, uh, as you alluded to there, quite an interest in languages in general, 
uh, and I believe that the case for more language learning is, is pretty self-evident. An ability and a willingness to pick up other languages is hugely beneficial to, to young people, both culturally and economically, in their future lives. There's plenty of evidence that multilingual young people uh, have a competitive advantage in the job market, and this is true of global companies who need to be able to do business around the world. But it's also increasingly true of the job market within Scotland itself. I think that's something that we often uh, forget, uh, where a job may well go to somebody who happens to have uh, an ability in languages because of that com competitive uh, advantage, because of their ability to converse, whether it be in German or Polish, or, or to make a, a phone call in Spanish. And I believe now is the time to create a cultural and educational environment which attracts children and young people to learn other languages and crucially expects it to be the norm. Uh, the government, as ever, is determined to be ambitious, and being ambitious is a good thing. Uh, we had a manifesto commitment to create the conditions in which every child will learn two languages in addition to their mother tongue. And it's vital that children are given these opportunities and so the report of the Languages Working Group presented strong arguments for giving children the opportunity to learn languages uh, at a very early age. So the government agrees with the, the Working Group and will strive to make it possible for young people to start to learn a second language from at least Primary 1 and a further language from Primary 5 onwards. Now, I would like convener to acknowledge that delivering additional languages from Primary 1 uh, is a bold and ambitious objective. Uh, there will be significant challenges for schools, um, and, but it can be done. And some schools are already providing such early access to language learning. I visited schools such as Sacred Heart Primary in Glasgow, where I saw deeply committed staff uh, teaching not one but four languages, with all pupils learning uh, at least one from Primary 1. And I know from uh, what we've just heard uh, from Mrs Eady uh, that the committee have obviously uh, uh, visited many such committed schools uh, around the country. As a government, we certainly recognise that an earlier start to language learning may be uh, something that raises challenges in terms of a school's capacity to deliver. Some teachers may not have language training, others may wish to update those skills, and therefore it will be essential for local authorities to provide an accurate picture of their existing provision and use that to plan ahead. This is a national policy, but it is clear that successful implementation will depend uh, uh, on local authorities' drive and determination to make this policy a reality. And I, I want to say, Convener, that I don't see local authorities as a, a passive consumer of this policy, uh, but uh, from all that I can see, uh, active and enthusiastic partners in its development. Now, there's been a lot of discussion around funding for languages policy, and I'm sure there'll be more today. Uh, I take this opportunity, however, to clarify what the £4 million allocated for this budget year is for. Now, some witnesses who have given evidence previously to this committee have referred to the £4 million as being a drop in the ocean and that more is needed uh, to implement the policy. Now, interestingly, no one has been able to put a monetary value on what amount of money would be enough. Uh, this is in part, I suspect, due to the fact that we are not starting from scratch. Uh, as Mr Coffey pointed out, we are not suddenly bringing languages into primary schools where there has previously been no provision, and crucially, we are not suddenly bringing teachers into primary schools uh, where teachers have been a novelty. Uh, we know that there is a lot of good practice uh, in learning out there, and so to be clear, this money is initial funding to local authorities to start to take forward our aims. Four million is equivalent to and in addition to the previous languages fund which local authorities continue to receive within their funding package. Uh, the aim is to support local authorities to deliver this commitment over two parliaments, that is by 2020. And local authorities are best placed to decide how to spend this uh, additional four million this year. It could be used for training teachers, for creating opportunities for teachers. It could be used for foreign language assistance, and it is for each education authority to make those decisions. Feedback on how the money is deployed in 2013-14 will be important in determining what funding is needed in subsequent years. And by way of conclusion, I just want to add that our commitment to an ambitious, and I use that word again, an ambitious new direction in language learning sends very strong signals 
that Scotland is open to business and to the world. And I hope that this ambition excites and engages not only those with a, an interest in language learning, uh, but everyone who wants uh, the best for our young people. OK, thanks very much for that, Minister, and you've answered my first two questions, so uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, just uh, to, to open out uh, one, of, one of the questions, one of the answers uh, is... Um, we did hear a lot of evidence of people saying that, that funding wasn't sufficient and how it should be spent. And I welcome your remarks this morning about the money should be spent on, you know, but the local authorities have got the, the ultimate control over that, but it should be spent on, you know, whether it's, it's uh, training teachers or providing uh, materials or provisions. Uh, but one of the concerns that some of the, the witnesses said was, would that money be ring-fenced in the, the terms that would it only be channelled towards language learning, uh, which was a concern that if the money goes into the general local authority pot, then it wouldn't uh, meet its final destination, which should be uh, teaching our young people languages. And I'm just wondering if you can maybe give us some insight into that. Well, I, I think that the enthusiasm is out there amongst local authorities to do this, and I think there's also increasingly going to be an expectation amongst parents and communities that this money be used for that purpose. I, I see no evidence uh, that local authorities are, are minded to, to, to divert this money in the way that you've indicated. Uh, and I think uh, that local authorities recognise that the scale of the project uh, and the, the worth of it. Uh, and uh, we have obviously moved away from a, a culture of, of ring fencing in most, although not all areas, uh, of local government funding. Uh, my strong impression is that, that the will is out there to make sure that this is used for the right purpose and the purpose for which I certainly intend it. Okay, thanks very much. And moving on to the sort of a best value element of how that money is spent and utilising those funds, some of the, the witnesses have suggested a hub approach. And we certainly had Judith McClure here from Confucius uh, uh, Institute who talked about how the hubs uh, were talked about for a long time, but now some of them have been realised. And certainly in, uh, in my constituency in Hamilton Grammar, they've got a very uh, successful Confucius hub. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether you're minded to, to recommend or suggest that a hub model would be the best or maybe... Uh, again, leaving it up to what, what, what the actual local school needs and the local learning community needs? Well, I certainly think that it's obviously up to, to local authorities and schools to, to make some of these decisions, but it is clearly, and officials can probably talk about this more than I can, but it's clearly uh, increasingly a model that's being used not just for Chinese languages, but for, for other areas of the curriculum too, where, where schools work together. Um, for instance, where clusters of schools work together uh, and I don't anticipate another question, but uh, to, to address the point that, that was raised by Mrs Eady, uh, obviously clusters of schools are in a good position to ensure that there's uh, a progression from primary to secondary in a way that, that makes sense as well. So I don't know if, if you want to talk a bit about the hub model at all, one of you. I'll, um, I'll say a bit about hubs because we also have, in addition to Confucius Classroom hubs, we've got literacy hubs that um, we're giving some funding to this year. Um, that funding goes to some local authorities, five local authorities around the country who have got expertise and innovative um, models of delivering literacy. And um, that's something we started funding last year and the funding is carrying on this year. I think it is for each local authority to decide <coughs> how best they wish to um, progress with this. And we'll be looking to authorities when they do their audits. Some of them may be come to us and say, we think this is best done through um, the provision of a hub, which we will then use, uh, deliver um, uh, innovative solutions, which will then farm out to other um, schools in, in the local authority. But I, I think, <coughs> excuse me, primarily it's um, for local authorities to decide how best they wish to, to take this forward. Thanks very much. Is it no? Helen, do you want to come in as a supplementary on that yes. topic yet? Okay. Um, yes, I mean, I, I'm personally very supportive of this initiative. I think it's excellent, it's the right way to go. But I'm still worried about the funding. And I'd be very grateful if you could just clarify for me, when you were speaking there just now, um, in your <coughs> preamble to answering questions, you said that um, this four million will be in addition to existing funds. Can you tell us what the existing funds are? Or can one of your officials tell us what the existing funds are? Well, How much they amount to? Sorry, I beg your pardon for, for interrupting you there. Yes, I can. Uh, obviously, the, the £4 million refers to, to the, this particular financial year. Uh, it's obviously also an addition to the, the Languages Fund, which local authorities uh, already have wrapped up uh, in their, their allocation. 
um, which, is a sim uh, which is in existence already. But I think <coughs> the crucial point is that, as, I, as I've indicated, um, I want to emulate other countries in Europe, in fact, every single other country in Europe, where all of this is, is regarded uh, as the norm. And without in any way taking away from the scale of the task that we face, we do want to get to a situation where um, uh, this is almost a, a question that isn't asked in the way that we don't ask how much does the government um, provide to ensure that mathematics is taught in primary schools. Um, perhaps some people do, I don't know, but it, it's taken as a given uh, that that is part of the primary school experience. I think we want to get to a situation where it's taken as a, a given uh, that children coming out of primary school are expected to have some exposure to, to other languages. But to answer the question, I am talking about this year's budget, and I'm talking about uh, four million pounds in addition to the languages fund, which is already wrapped up uh, in the, the local government settlement. Uh, and uh, future years are uh, something I am not going to anticipate for the reason that uh, I am not Mr. Swinney, and uh, I don't intend to anticipate future budgets. But for this year, I can say that's how the budget stands. I'm sorry to come back, but I'm sorry, Minister, you didn't answer my question because you said uh, you talked about the £4 million, uh -huh. but you didn't say to me what the existing fund amounts to in the global amount for the overall budget in Scotland. And I don't mind if you can't answer Did. I just was hoping one of your officials could actually answer that, well, please. I, I'm sorry if I misunderstood you, Mrs. Edia. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly said that £4 million has been allocated anew on top of an existing £4 million. It was pounds. that existing amount. Of £4 million. Oh, You've got an existing amount of £4 million which plus is, £4 million, which is £8 million. Is that is, what you're Well, officials right. can come, Sorry. come in on this, but £4 Sorry, million is, all, is, already, is already in the allocation for yeah. local authorities. Yeah. The, <clears throat> the, pr previously, there was a ring-fenced budget, which was called the Languages Fund, and it was allocated to local authorities <clears throat> on a distribution model. And that was wrapped up uh, and not ring-fenced um, at, at the time of the Concordat with uh, with local with COSLA, and it, that that was wrapped up in the grant aided expenditure that now goes to local authorities for them to, to uh, in their overall package for them to decide how to to, to utilise. So it, <coughs> to, to confirm the, the minister's point, it's four million pounds plus another four million, eight million pounds. And if I may, has a guidance certificate a letter gone out to every local authority on this as well that? Because I got the impression when we visited Dunny Bristol School, for example, that the teachers there didn't know anything about this funding. Um, so, you know, I'm just it's anxious. Like Secret from local authorities or anyone else? No, we, we, were, we were discussing with uh, COSLA just yesterday okay. <clears throat> um, about this new £4 million, pounds, because obviously the, we um, need to, to talk to them about the, the, the distribution model that will be, be utilised. But uh, local authorities know about it. Uh, it is. It is coming. It's been talked about in this uh, in this committee. Education conveners. Sorry to cut across you, but was that the education conveners that you were discussing this we, with? We yesterday? were talking to officials in Cosla. Oh, officials, but yeah. not councils directly themselves. I should maybe clarify uh, that this has been made public. So, I mean, education conveners, as I say, this is this is not something that's been kept private in any way. Uh, local authorities have been made aware of this. Cosla has been made aware of this. Obviously, local authorities will wish to share this internally with education conveners and others, but. It's, it's not something that's been kept from anyone. I want you to succeed with this. It's, uh, I'm not asking these questions no, just no. to be difficult. Uh, but, you know, the impression <coughs> I got is that not everyone's getting the message, especially people at the grassroots. And, you know, I think you're right. I mean, I've visited five countries across Europe at Easter, and you're absolutely right. Every one of them, um, you know, I talk about Eastern European countries, ones that are supposed to be behind us in development from five years old and upwards, they're getting this language teaching. So it's the right policy but we want to make sure the measures are in place for it to succeed. I, I certainly would, would agree with all of that. Okay. Jamie, brief supplementary? Oh, yes, the £4 yeah. million, pounds, sorry, is allocated, that's £4 million allocated between the 32 different local authorities, is it? This, this is for, for, the, for Scotland, uh -huh. yes, yes, and the total is £4 million uh -huh. between the 32 local authorities. Uh -huh. And is that on a per headage basis within those areas? Well, this, this will come down to the local government settlement, but maybe you can talk about that. Yeah. Oh, yes. This is the thing we were talking to COSLA officials about yesterday, um, as the, the, the distribution model 
on, um, so they're going to come back to us with some proposals for how it is best distributed, how it's most fairly distributed between the 32 authorities, whether it's done on a per head basis, on a pupil basis, or teacher basis, or school basis. You know, they have to consider all of that, and no doubt they'll be taking it to um, the, their executive and their councillors to agree on the best funding. But <clears throat> they know it's coming, and it's four million pounds between 32 authorities. Sorry to ask you again about this, but the four million that's already there, how is that distributed? Is that on per pupil basis or on a... It's wrapped up in the, the local government settlements, so it's, it's done on the, the same formula that the, the rest of the local government settlement is for local authorities. And the new formula then will be on the same, same the, the idea? New, the, new, the new formula for distribution is something that we're presently seeking to get uh, an agreement with COSLA on, so that's something that's under discussion just now. Councillor? Yes. Um, <coughs> It's just a supplementary on what you've already had discussed. The additional four million, is that also going to be ring fenced or not? I think the, the, the direction of travel, as I say, is, is for not ring fencing. I don't think there's any indications that that's the way that we're likely to go on that. But as I say, the, the strong pressure I think would exist and the strong will would exist within local authorities to make sure it's used for languages. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I've got one final question for you, Minister, before I open it out to, to the colleagues on the committee. And it was, you, you'll be aware of the Higher Education Academy report that was published yesterday, um, which is a review into the present state of Slavonic and Eastern European studies in higher education. And I know that we, we, our focus is on primary education right now, but there has been a bit of interest to, uh, to the committee from outside bodies about a comment on that, and, and I'm really just looking for a comment on it from you at this stage. Well, certainly the, the comment that was made specifically about uh, Slavonic uh, languages, uh, obviously universities are autonomous bodies and, and ministers really don't have a direct say at all in, in how they um, run their courses. So I think it would be inappropriate perhaps for me to attempt to do that. Um, in terms of some of the wider coverage uh, around that, suggesting that the fact that Scotland was having a constitutional debate meant that we were no longer learning languages uh, that wasn't the, the body that you're referring to that made those comments, but, but some of the, the wider press comment, I think, was very far wide of the mark. Indeed, we're, we're doing quite the reverse. We're, we're having a national debate about how we ensure that people uh, learn languages. Uh, as I say, I don't have a direct say on how universities teach their courses. I think just uh, for a matter of interest, one of the primary schools that, that the vice convener and I visited in Glasgow, there was a young woman there from a Russian back background who started a Russian club. And they were teaching Russian in the class, but the parents and pupils were coming to an after-school club on Russian. And I think um, I think some of the issues was about whether we were teaching a Russian higher was with some of the comment yesterday. But certainly what, what, what we seen at primary school level was really enthusiastic young people using the skills of their mother tongue to, to inform and peer educate um, not only uh, the their contemporaries in their classroom, but the, the parents and the teachers as well, which I think, you know, f for me, this inquiry that, 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 that we've conducted right now, certainly the evidence I've got is not about qualification, it's about confidence um, and about building that confidence into our young people at the, at the earliest stage. And I think for, from the Russian point of view, certainly what we've seen from a small acorn, I think will, will, will grow pretty pretty well. So um, really, that was just for your information more than anything. I think that the phrase you used there about uh, Confidence, though, is, is relevant. Uh, certainly, uh, um, we, we can't anticipate what line of work or um, what country even uh, people will live in from, from encountering at the age of five and primary one. Um, what we can try, however, and do is give young people the confidence that learning languages is a natural thing to do. Um, we can also try and ensure that across Scotland there's a fairly wide range of languages taught. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to ensure um, in teaching languages in primary uh, is giving our young people the idea that going on to learn languages, whether it's learning languages for, for work or for cultural reasons, is a normal thing to do. Um, that expectation hasn't been there traditionally, although it's beginning to change, thanks to the hard work that's being done in primary schools. But, but confidence is certainly key to this, yes. Thank you very much. Rod? Okay, Minister, uh, are there any crumbs of comfort you can say for the Slavonic and Eastern European languages in terms of the, the, where we're going forward with the primary one plus two? I mean, is it possible that uh, we might want to incorporate, at least in some primary schools, some emphasis on these languages? Well, certainly, as I've indicated, we want to be um, broad in our uh, definition of, of the languages taught in schools. 
Um, one of the um, things that was said by the working group that reported on this was that they didn't want to try and come up with a hierarchy of, of languages in terms of which were, were more relevant to the exercise than others. Uh, and, and certainly there will be a wide range of European and non-European, including perhaps Slavonic languages, uh, which may feature in the schools in the future. But this entirely depends on the presence of, of teachers who are confident enough um, to begin to engage with those languages. But it's also relevant to say that um, people who bring to school, children who bring, bring to school a community language, um, if there is an ability in that school, at least at primary level, to incorporate that in the work of the school, then that should be given some recognition when we talk about one plus two as well. Um, and that community languages are important in this respect too. Okay, thank you very much. And hands on. Yeah, thank you, Minister. Um, I'm just wondering what the Scottish Government is going to do about increasing the number of um, foreign language assistants in our schools in Scotland. And would schools qualify for additional resource to encourage them to go down that route? Well, there has been, quite rightly, uh, a lot of comment about the, the decline in the numbers of foreign language assistance being provided uh, in schools. We've managed to stabilise the figures this year, thanks to quite a lot of contact um, with... Uh, I met some time ago with um, a number of European uh, consulates in Edinburgh uh, and with the British Council and others. Uh, I would like to think, to answer your second point uh, about funding, that of the £4 million that's being provided for languages, some local authorities may wish to use some of that money on foreign language assistance, who are good value for money, it must be said, uh, and I recognise the points that have been made there. But again, it's up to local authorities how they want to prioritise that. But certainly, uh, there is no bar on the money that's being provided this year being used to, to appoint foreign language assistance. Um, and... Um what is the Scottish Government's opinion on whether the budgets for uh, foreign language assistance, should that be, in fact, ring-fenced in some instances to encourage the employment of um, FLS uh, staff because of uh, special circumstances, and particularly in rural areas where they will be under a lot of pressure? Again, I've indicated that uh, that there is no real, in, there is no real likelihood, I think, of, of ring fencing in any of these areas, and I think it, it has to be left up to local authorities to decide whether foreign language assistance are their priority or, or some other uh, aspect uh, of language teaching. Uh, in terms of rural areas, uh, um, there is a, a, a recognition, I think, that rural schools, as they have always been, have to be flexible. Uh, they do face particular challenges. Um, but if they operate flexibly, for instance, um, I know a number of rural schools bring in people from the community who have languages, whether it's community languages or European languages, um, to help with the task. Um, you mentioned earlier on, or some of you mentioned earlier on, schools cooperating together. Again, perhaps officials can come in with more about the situation of, of uh, the curriculum in rural schools. I think it's fair to say, sorry, Camina. I think it's fair to say that rural schools are going to need to think quite creatively about how to deliver this challenge, as they need to think creatively about um, existing curricular pressures. I think one of the committee members, I forget who, was mentioning I ICT, and it seems to me that there is certainly a lot of potential um, to do more uh, in that arena to support language learning in particular in, in rural environments. Um, I know many schools already take advantage of e-twinning, which isn't the same as, as language teaching and learning, but I think it's an indication of the way that some of some developments may support this policy, particularly in the rural environment. I think it's also worth, worth saying that a number of uh, rural schools already, as you've indicated there, um, cooperate, perhaps neighbouring schools, um, through GLOW and other means for all sorts of things in the curriculum just now. I, I visited a, a school recently where um, it wasn't a foreign language they were learning because I think they were using the medium of English, but they were uh, communicating with a school in Zambia and it was a, an eye-opener to the children when it was explained to them that the, the, uh, the people at the other end uh, had to get two buses and walk three miles to get to a computer. So all these things can come together. Language learning can actually, not in that instance, but in many other instances, can open children's eyes to all sorts of other things about the world around them. Can I just come back on the FLA point um, that um, Hans-Alemak 
um, mentioned. Um, I think when I, I gave evidence to the committee on the, uh, in early January, I pointed out that this £4 million, if used for foreign language assistance, could um, result in some 500 foreign language assistants coming uh, to work in, in, in schools. But we were talking to um, uh, one of the authorities uh, who was uh, wanting to know uh, more about the, the £4 million for, for this year, and they confirmed to us that they will now be taking foreign language assistance, whereas before they hadn't been. So I think you know some authorities are thinking about the advantages a foreign language assistant ca can have for their schools to have a foreign national in their schools to not only talk the language but to tell them about their country and what happens there. So that's a global citizenship agenda that they'll be uh, also delivering in that. So I think local authorities um, could uh, well use this, this funding for um, foreign language assistance and benefit on many areas as a result. That brings me nicely on to my next uh, question and that was how can the Scottish Government uh, assist schools to tap into the European funding that's available? I understand it's um, under uh, used and applied for, uh, particularly from Scottish schools, and I'm wondering whether that assistance, can, assistance could be got without tapping into the eight million that they're going to be getting, uh, because uh, hopefully they'll be, in fact, bringing new monies in. Uh, and so, um, what if anything's in the in the pipeline to encourage that to take place? Well, yes, the answer is that that would be new money if it's European money. And I think um, one of the things that we can certainly do is try to simplify the, the process, recognise, simplify the, the process, particularly for uh, Comenius programmes. But there's also obviously Erasmus programmes, the new Erasmus programme, um, Erasmus for All programme from 2014, uh, which will take in both Comenius and Erasmus. And uh, I think there is much that we can do to, to promote those. Uh, but I think you can talk more, Sue, about those. Certainly um, happy to support what you've just been saying, Minister, and I think we absolutely recognise that there is a challenge here for, for teachers and for local authorities um, in, in getting through some of the bureaucracy around this. Um, we'd see this as quite a key plank of um, freeing up more resources from, from European level. I mean, it, it's possible, of course, to, to, to pay for foreign language assistance, and they are very good value, but it would also be possible um, to secure community assistance to come and do similar, if not identical, uh, work in schools to great benefit and possibly at, at, at reduced cost. Uh, and some of that is about negotiating the bureaucracy. So absolutely, we fully intend to work with the British Council and other relevant organisations, including SILT, um, to, to try to negotiate this better so that we're tapping into more resource on this. Clearly, there's potential. Just, just to come back, I, I'm, I'm, I was more keen to, to see the path that we would take. I mean, how, how do we do this? How do we encourage schools to participate in that? Are we going to actually set up a system where the schools can contact someone centrally for that assistance so that we can, you know, so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel every time a school wants to apply for something or a cluster for that matter? Again, I, I don't want to say that I have an answer to that yet. That is something that certainly is being worked on. But I think we do want to, to avoid the situation that's existed in the past where, for instance, uh, Comenius, I think it's fair to say, has been underused. Um, and we want to find out why and if government can do something to try and, and simplify that and bring schools together on that, then we will certainly try. Very helpful, thank you. Okay, can I bring Helen in? Because I think uh, Helen's got specific questions around about uh, Erasmus and, and Comenius and move on to your other Thanks very questions. much, Convener. And, you know, I think it was one of these issues that when we were speaking with the teachers, particularly Donny Bristol School, uh, one of the issues that they brought up was the issue of getting, first of all, time off. But also, in getting that time off, there needed to be the backup support. And so, I mean, I think one of the issues that maybe representations need to be made to Brussels about is that whilst it's fine to give the package of support for finance for the teachers to travel to other schools across Europe, one of the issues that maybe needs to be addressed in that is how do the schools get the backup funding for that? Should that be funding through part of the Erasmus programme? Because you can't just take a, a teacher out of the equation and then leave the school without. Somebody somewhere needs to pay for that teacher as well. So um, may maybe that's a an issue that 
could be made through representations to Brussels when programmes are being reviewed. Um, and I think it is an issue <coughs> about this publicity about all these programmes, because certainly when we saw these teachers at Donny Bristol, um, they said it was very random, and we heard that from some of the witnesses that we've had before us as well. And we really are keen that this, you know, does succeed, this programme. So, um, and I think if you look at a previous report that the committee had before when we were looking at all the funding programmes across Europe, and I would appeal to you to raise this with all your ministers, um, Minister, and that is that, you know, there is EU funding that I don't think we're working hard enough at accessing, and that's not to be critical about officials. I know how extraordinarily difficult it is to access that funding, because I've done it personally, but we need to get a really good handle on that. And as has been said by Hans Alla, there needs to be centralised uh, advice and support agents who can help with that and publicise it properly. Obviously, there's a major uh, undertaking at the moment in terms of uh, auditing the provision that there is around uh, modern languages in schools just now. And certainly if that throws up some of the problems you've described in terms of uh, teachers finding it difficult to access um, some of these uh, courses and activities um, because of that issue, um, then that's certainly something we would want to discuss with local authorities and, if necessary, with, with Brussels. But mm -hmm. do you, either of you want to come in on that? Well, I'd, I'd like to um, uh, uh, say that um, uh, from, from my previous experience, I'm well aware that <clears throat> there are lots of opportunities for teachers to undertake um, visits uh, to to other European countries or I internationally, and um, uh, getting the the publicity out there to teachers who are very very busy individuals is very difficult because some teachers are interested in this they pick it up and they they, they take advantage of this and it is a bit ad hoc but the the bodies like the British Council are forever. Uh, doing their best to advertise the, these opportunities. And British Council Scotland administer the Comenius program for us. And you go to their website, there's lots of information there. It's about negotiating the bureaucracy, yes, but it's also about um, whether teachers are actually um, absorbing the information that's provided for them. Um, the other thing I'd say is that uh, one of the things we're doing is setting up a strategic implementation group working with uh, the Association of Directors of Education of Scotland. They'll co-chair with, with ourselves the Strategic Implementation Group. And the, um, the, the, the uh, Director of, of Education in Stirling Council, Belinda Greer, is going to be the association representative on that group. She will go back to her fellow directors, all 32, and be able to pass on these kinds of things that you know these opportunities are there what are, are we doing collectively to, to take advantage of them so i think there's there's a couple of strands here it's about publicity it's about information but you know at, at the end of the day it's teachers who will benefit from this they will will need to find out for themselves whether the, about these opportunities and take them make the most of them <clears throat> Just to add to that, really, that um, we've, obviously we've, um, there have been a number of questions about what authorities might spend this additional £4 million for in the current financial year. Uh, and, it, and it may well be that some of that is about freeing up teacher time. The teachers are incredibly busy people, as we all know, and actually enabling some of those discussions to be had to, to actually digest some of the information that, that is available, but it, but it all takes time to, to consider and, and have a plan about how to meaningfully act upon that information at a teacher level, at a school level, indeed at an authority level. Um, so I, th I think that's where some of the funding might, might actually come into play this year. I think it's also worth adding that uh, signposting teachers, to use the jargon, towards what's available is, is, a, is a major exercise that's, that's worth doing um, because of, uh, as, as Tim referred to, the, 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 the busy lives that teachers have. Um, signposting and helping teachers find what's available is, is, a, is a useful task to provide. Okay. You're going to my next question. Yeah, is that certainly. okay, convenient? Um, I think that you know one of the big challenges that you have as well is it's not just <coughs> amongst children in schools. It's how do we mobilise and motivate all Scottish citizens to get on board with this initiative too? And so, I'm just wondering: is you know how do you intend to promote the one plus two uh, model both in schools and amongst the Scottish citizens to try to change their attitudes? Because we all know that when we go abroad, and I'm as guilty as anyone else. And um, we think, well, we speak English, everyone else should follow us. 
but clearly, you know, in this modern world, that's not sufficient. So just wondering how you'll tackle that issue, uh, Minister. One, one of the key things is, is a, an argument that's being put quite regularly. I notice when I visit schools now by, by modern language, teachers uh, are not an argument, a fact, which is, of course, that 75% of the world's population don't speak English, and most of the 25% who do speak it as a second language. And, and that fact, when, when young people and their parents are presented with it, comes as quite a revelation. Um, and I think that... Uh, some, some of it comes down to education in its broadest sense, but, but some of it also comes down to the, the relationship between, that schools have with parents. And if you look at um, really good examples of, um, of schools engaging with parents, they bring parents into the classroom. And it doesn't take long before, before parents realise that something dramatic and new is happening and how different school is to when they went to school. So it's, it's a cultural change. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think key to it is, is going to happen at a school level. Um, much as I like to believe that um, parents throughout Scotland hang on my every word when I talk about curriculum for excellence, I suspect they ultimately believe and listen more to the information that comes from their schools. Um, and I think that uh, as this becomes more and more of a feature of life in primary schools, it's going to be something that, that parents are, are more conscious of. More generally, to answer your question uh, in terms of attitudes, um, I would like to think that perhaps attitudes are beginning to, to change slightly. People are more used to, I think, than they were 30 years ago, to hear somebody in the street speaking another language. I think they're more used to travel, uh, and I think they're certainly more used to the idea um, that, that the world might be a multilingual place. I suppose where it falls down is that so much of what we see on television comes from America or is in English, and perhaps that's the, the that's perhaps the, the weak link in all this. I think culturally we have to start to watch a bit more a bit, a bit more Borgen. Or killing. Indeed. <laughs> or killing. Okay. Yeah. Willie Coffee. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning, Minister. I'd like to to ask a question on IT, if I, if I could. Um, some of our witnesses, um, their experiences of using GLOW in particular were, were, were not particularly successful, they were, they were telling us. Uh, and I wanted to ask, as someone who has worked with Learning and Teaching Scotland, it's now Education Scotland for many years, and seeing, in my view, the, the successful uh, uh, implementation and impact that technology can have in learning and teaching, could you tell us a wee bit, perhaps, about GLOW itself and how we plan to, to deploy that, perhaps more effectively, to assist with the teaching of modern languages in the primary? I think it can have a major, major impact. And I know from experience that we have incredible skills and abilities within that organisation at Education Scotland to make a real impact here. So I was hoping to get your views on where we are with GLOW and the IT impact in learning and teaching in particular. Well, my impression is that as GLOW develops and changes, which it clearly is, is doing, uh, particularly things like the authentication process for getting into GLOW are, are going to become a lot more user-friendly. Uh, I can see the demand for its services increasing uh, in schools, and I, I certainly think that it does lend itself quite particularly to uh, language learning because of your ability to speak to somebody in Germany or Japan, because of your ability to, particularly as we mentioned before in smaller schools, uh, pool activity, listen to your own voice, do all sorts of things. So I think it does lend itself to that. And as I say, with the changes that are taking place to make it more user friendly, I can see more of that happening. Do we see um, it being extended so that it can be used widely at home, perhaps, too, so that people can can access materials at home. You, you mentioned the, the American TV experience there, which I think is very rele relevant to, to the task that we face in, in giving our children the opportunity to experience other languages and so on and so forth. Do you see that broadening and widening so that we can have access to that very much more at home? I think culturally now uh, we're beginning to see... Um, parents accessing the work that their children are doing at school electronically, seeing what's happening in their school electronically. Uh, GLOW has a, a role uh, in that, certainly. 
Um, and I think uh, also there are other things beginning to happen, like uh, own device technology, people bringing their own phones into school, and I appreciate not everybody has them, but people bringing their own phones into school and, and engaging in what's happening in the classroom that way. More and more schools uh, introducing Wi-Fi in the building to allow people to bring in their own technology into the schools. Uh, I think that the culture of what happens in schools is, is now changing very quickly. Uh, GLOW is now seeking to, to keep up with that and keep pace with that. Um, but languages certainly, as I say, do lend themselves to that kind of experience. Just, just to add on that, um, something that um, I don't think we've mentioned today and possibly not much on previous occasions is the potential for interdisciplinary learning um, to take forward uh, the commitment of, of one plus two mm. languages. And ICT is just one area where uh, the, the the possibilities are, are probably limitless in, in how um, one might motivate, excite, encourage young people to be using languages creatively and in ways that, that they feel are very relevant to, to modern life and work. I think um, a, a great example in uh, St Elizabeth's Primary School in Hamilton, which I know the Minister has visited with me in the past, was they had used a programme uh, with a link to the, to the University in Glasgow for their science projects where they asked questions of a professor in science, but the answer came back as an avatar, which was Yoda. And the kids absolutely loved this experience, but the teachers who were using that in science had said to the language teachers, maybe we could use something similar in languages. So they were setting up a similar programme with a professor you know, in one of the universities to answer questions in foreign languages. I don't think they'd uh, agreed on the avatar yet, um, but certainly uh, Yoda was very, very popular in, in that school in particular. And that's just an example of that interdisciplinary, using something in science. How can we then use that you know, in, a, in another subject? And maybe at some point bring both of them together as well. So that's a, a great example of uh, uh, teachers innovating. To come back, if I may, on that point, I think that's all very um, true and pertinent because um, we talk about the crowded curriculum and how do we fit languages in. Of course, languages are a subject. Languages are also a medium. Languages are a means of communicating something else. Um, you don't talk about French and French. You might talk about French and French, but you're more likely to talk about what's going on in the world round about you in real life if you're using a language. Um, for instance, the, the experience of Gallant Medium Schools show that the success of Gallant Medium Schools isn't that they sit and talk about Gallic verbs, and they write, there's only 11 commonly used irregular ones, Gallic verbs all day, they talk about science, or they talk about history, or they talk about maths in Gallic. Now, I'm not suggesting that in primary schools which aren't immersion in the way that Gallant Medium Schools are, we're going to have quite that experience, but I do think that increasingly, as this rolls out, we are going to see um, uh, children using the language that they are learning for something practical in the classroom. And I think that is a, a conceptual leap we have to begin to understand as well. Well, that's exactly where St Elizabeth's were, because the day, the day we were in, and it was my colleague Claire Adams and I, uh, they decided that that day everyone would speak Spanish for the day. So it wasn't just during the lesson, you know, it was whatever lessons were going on that day, whatever games were being played, and what they were having for their lunch. And they all had a discussion about what was in their packed lunch in Spanish. Um, and these were five and six year olds. We were mightily impressed and heartily embarrassed, I have to say, that, that our skills, um, certainly Twister, a game of Twister in, in Spanish is quite interesting, especially when you don't realise that it's your hair you should have on the red <laughs> and the local journalist has a photograph of that you know so <laughs> but they, they, they did that they used that as, a, as you know they would have a French day they would have an Italian day they would have a Spanish day and everything that that day would be would be done in that language so certainly uh, that leap's been made in, in that particular skill and they, they, they were a great example of that okay I think moving on to Roddy and then we'll come back to Billy for your follow-up questions Roddy Minister we heard uh, kind of evidence from people about the importance of uh, primary school uh, teachers having a language quali qualification. What's the, the government's kind of current thinking on, on that issue? Well, the, uh, there is a, a debate that's being had within the, the teaching community about some of these issues, and uh, uh, there has been a debate that has you know, been raised in the past about whether a language or indeed a science qualification should be a qualification before uh, entry to um, degrees, uh, courses, uh, in order to, to train to become a teacher. Uh, I think the, the more prevailing uh, mood at the moment is that there are opportunities uh, during a, a teacher's teacher education, initial teacher education, uh, 
um, where languages can be provided. Certainly, I know that in places where this has been offered, where um, uh, courses have been offered uh, around modern languages, the take-up has been high, the enthusiasm has been high, and I suspect that that will, will only increase once people see that, uh, as I think they already are, uh, modern languages are going to form part of the, the primary school curriculum in a, in a routine way. Um, so I don't know if that completely answers your question. I, again, officials may want to come in on that, but my sympathies, I think, are, uh, or the teaching profession's sympathies, I think, are more around providing uh, um, opportunities around languages uh, during the initial teacher education itself. Um, <clears throat> the General Teaching Council um, for Scotland is uh, consulting on this issue at the moment. Um, the <clears throat> Languages Working Group recommended that teachers um, should, or primary teachers should um, have uh, a hire either on entry to or exit from their teacher training course and the General Teaching Council is, is currently consulting on that. I think the consultation ends in June so it's, it's, it will be for them to decide on it but I think the general feeling is that um, by doing that you would perhaps exclude some teachers who uh, or potential teachers who would be extremely good teachers um, and so I think um, as the Minister to mention, that there's also been a debate about whether primary teachers should also have a higher qualification in a science to enable them to um, better deliver science education. So the, the debate is, is out there at the, and the jury's out. I think the, the reason that it was one of the few uh, recommendations of the working group that the government only partially um, accepted uh, was because we, we respect the role of the General Teaching Council in a sense to have this debate before we before we step in. I think that the teaching profession itself has to, to some extent, answer that question. Um, in response to the National Partnership Group report, um, the government supported the establishment of a formal partnership between local authorities and universities as a way of enhancing um, the early stages of teacher training. How's that progressing? I think I'm going to have to defer again. No, I, I I fear we may not be able to provide a full story on that uh, in this meeting this morning, but happy to, to find that information and be in touch. Well, it would be helpful if you could provide we that can, information. We can certainly come back on that, yeah, but okay. I, have to, I have to admit that that's something I will have to find out more on for you. Are there any other initiatives underway supporting teacher training and CPD for languages um, for both existing and new teachers? Well, for instance, one of the things that's happening uh, around the, the audit or the, the examination of, of what, uh, uh, what needs to be done around languages in primary schools, one of the things that's being done is trying to assess what skills already exist. Uh, there'll be people in, in primary teaching who have formal qualifications in languages, there'll be people who, who have languages who've never really used them in teaching, uh, there'll be people who have a, an aptitude or an interest in, in using languages in, in primary schools. Uh, we need to uh, firstly uh, assess uh, of what those what those talents and, and uh, uh, aptitudes are. Um, but I think there's also a recognition from the outset, and again, it featured in the the, uh, the working group's recommendations that uh, we can't. Uh, we can't pin all this cultural change on, on new generations of teachers um, uh, and their initial teacher training. Um, we do have to look at uh, what the opportunities are for continuing professional development and do so from a relatively early stage uh, and recognise that uh, this, this will be a major part of continuing professional development for primary teachers in the future. Um, some witnesses finally um, said that lessons could be learned from the 1990s about issues in terms of the lack of priority and resources given to languages and not tracking uh, teachers who've been trained. Um, what do you say to that? Well, I suppose the, the, the point I made earlier about uh, trying to assess what skills are out there is, is par partly to do with that and trying to, to track the, um, the aptitudes and, and abilities and, uh, uh, and existing training that, that teachers have. Uh, I wouldn't say we want to track all teachers uh, uh, in uh, every aspect of their continuing professional development, but I certainly think it would be a waste of, of our resources if, if local authorities uh, didn't have, have some idea where to find people, um, particularly when we're talking about schools cooperating more closely together in the future. So yes, to some extent, we need to do that. Again, do you want to come in on that at all? I, 
I just want to um, add, just in, in general, in general support, you know, um, one, one of the body, bodies we fund is uh, Scotland's National Centre for Languages, SILTS, um, uh, and they have, um, they're running the pilot projects this year for us um, in, in schools, which have, has al already been, been mentioned um, previously, but they, they've got a special uh, resource that they've uh, made available for local authorities uh, on the website as a sort of toolkit for issues to take into account in sort of examining what their pr current provision is and, and um, how they would best um, deliver this for the future. So there's, there's quite a lot of resource already going into this. They're going around the country talking to local authorities and advising them on that. And obviously Education Scotland is the national education body. They're providing a lot of support um, to local authorities in examining how they will deliver this policy as well. But two supplementaries on this topic, um, Hansala and then Julie. Yes, um, you've raised an interesting point, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, Minister, whether there is a scope uh, and an opportunity to tap into uh, existing resources uh, in two terms. One is uh, teachers who have perhaps recently uh, retired, and uh, we could perhaps uh, encourage them to reconsider coming back to us specifically on languages, uh, even if it's part-time. And also perhaps uh, teachers who may have left the, uh, the teaching profession and then we could perhaps encourage them to come back with a refresher course so that they could take up that uh, teaching post again. And that I think would assist us in trying to uh, plug a lot of the gaps in the shortfall uh, and uh, of course I think give us an opportunity to fast track what we're trying to achieve. Look, that's certainly an interesting idea. I mean, I think primarily it's important to say that we are in primary uh, schools talking about uh, upskilling the, the teachers who are already there and, and who know their classes and are, are likely to use uh, modern languages in the day-to-day -day life of the class. Um, but certainly, as part of Education Scotland's exercise just now, I'm sure that's something that we'll want to consider uh, whether there is any scope in that. Jimmy? Thank you. Um, just in relation to what you said about the future primary school teachers having language qualifications and that this has been partially accepted by the Scottish Government um, but referred to the GTCS for their consideration, which you said, I accept that, but can you tell us when the GTCS are going to give a verdict on this? I mean, how, what, what time, have you, have you said to them, you've got to tell us quite soon, because obviously it's very important. I, I haven't, as it were, instructed them to come up with this. This is a debate they're already having, it should be said. And I think they're due, it's not, it's not a debate sine die, uh, I think they are due to come forward uh, relatively soon. But I should clarify, it's not something I've, I've given them to do. Do I have a date? I, I, I think it's, uh, the, the consultation is out at the moment and that ends in June. But I think their, um, their new uh, framework would come into place um, for 2014. Right. So, so they will come back and say whether they think it's a good idea or not. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Moving on, back to Willie Coffey. Thanks again, Convener. Um, could I just turn a uh, focus towards the, the role that c local communities and perhaps parents at, at home could play um, during our uh, inquiry? Uh, many teachers supported the idea that for better and more involvement from local communities and parents at home. Minister, um, do we have any proposals or ideas of how schools could best put that into practice? Um, I'm thinking particularly about when some of the children I met in my visits to schools, I, I did ask them specifically, what exposure do you have to foreign languages or non-English at home? And some would say we don't have any. Um, so uh, we've mentioned the impact that the IT could play there in a significant role, I think. But do we see any other potential uh, advice that we could offer to local authorities and schools to widen the, the, the impact on this and to involve communities and in, in schools in this initiative? Well, I suppose to some extent the obvious answer to that is that schools, and this is something that schools quite often now do, is sit down and count how many languages are actually spoken in the homes uh, or that are represented in their school. Uh, I know that uh, in the Western Isles where I represent, uh, I think I think one of the schools, maybe the, the local authority as a whole came up with a list of 16 without trying very hard. Um, and I think that one of the ways that uh, 
children can be made aware of the existence and importance of other languages is what's often a revelation to them, which is that some people in their class may in fact speak another language to their parents. Uh, and that, that can be a, a, a tremendously worthwhile exercise in itself. Uh, yeah, and speaking to some of the, the, the children that, and during one of my visits, the, their, their um, desire was to learn American. <laughs> one of them wanted to learn American. But I, I detected too from some of the responses that parents were wanting to be more helpful. Perhaps parents that didn't themselves have a, a second language at all. And they were looking, I think, for a, a connection to, to assist because they're very supportive of this initiative and they wanted something perhaps the school to do something with the local community or to invite parents to be more participative in that. And I think, convener, I'm just looking for suggestions or ideas or, or advice from the Scottish Government that could, could bring that process much, much further forward. Well, there are certainly things that the, the Government uh, uh, constantly does, I suppose, to encourage community relations and to, to encourage um, diversity and to uh, encourage schools to think about these issues. But do you want to come in on some of that? Sure. I think schools have a, a quite a, a very significant challenge already in terms of how best to engage with, with parents and communities about the education of the children involved in the life of the school. And speaking as a parent of a primary one child, it's been very interesting to see what comes from school in terms of um, expecting parental involvement, simply informing um, myself and my husband about what is going on and indeed inviting us to events. We've, we, we routinely receive things on literacy, on numeracy, invited to attend assemblies, science fairs, across a range of curricular areas. I would hope that in a few years' time it is a norm that that sort of information is flowing on matters around learning other languages as well, that as well as a few words to spell at home, you might have foreign words that they're expected to practice. It's the mainstreaming that the Minister has alluded to already, and I would view that as part of uh, the existing challenge of engaging parents and bringing parents in to the substance and the experiences that their children are having in the school. And on that mainstreaming point, I suspect um, that in... Germany, if 11-year-olds were coming home, coming home without uh, some ability in English, or if in Italy 11-year-olds were coming home without some, without some ability in French, uh, parents would be knocking on the door of the school in the same way that here um, people would knock on the door of the school if uh, people came home aged 11 uh, without some ability to count. I think it's that big a cultural change we're talking about. Thank you for that. That kind of neatly moves me on to my, my second question about how do we fit it all in. As a, a number of uh, contributors during the course of this had said, we're really busy at the moment, the curriculum is already very tight. How, do we, how can we possibly fit in one language, let alone two, an additional one? So what are your thoughts on that, Minister, about how we can make the curriculum as flexible as possible to enable this to, to be done successfully? Well, I, I certainly wouldn't want to try and minimise the the the, uh, the extent to which this will this will require work and it, it will require uh, planning and uh, I, I would certainly acknowledge that that teachers are are very busy people. Um, I think you mentioned flexibility and I think that this is what's key to all this, which is that um, the curriculum for excellence uh, in primary schools is all about flexibility. It's all about uh, allowing teachers scope to uh, bring in new material to allow people to learn at the, their own rates. Uh, it's all about uh, ensuring that there's cross-curricular work. And as I've indicated already, if, if there's one subject that lends itself to, to cross-curricular work, uh, it's certainly languages which can be used to talk about pretty much anything. Um, now, that's, that's easy to say, of course, in advance. I appreciate the, the degree to which there'll have to be training and planning and work. Um, but I, I do think that it would have been difficult to do this if we'd been working under a system where we didn't have the flexibility that Curriculum for Excellence uh, provides. I think it would be very difficult to do if we'd been working with a system which sought to plan out hour by hour, um, as the French Education Minister does, uh, what happens in every school uh, every day. I think it's only possible to do when we allow teachers discretion. And I think... Uh, for that reason, Curriculum for Excellence makes it possible. I think, I think I'm encouraged by that. And uh, again, I'd like to share an example with the committee and the, and the minister that when I visited one of my own schools, I think it was in Comores Primary School, the children were doing a, a PE lesson, but there was a French theme to it. 
which, which maybe a few years ago would have been unthinkable as to why we would ever do such a thing, but this is very much happening in, in schools in Scotland now, and learning and, and, and doing some physical exercise, but using the medium of French to achieve that was actually very, very encouraging. I think that, that's true. I mean, the, the, the prime example of this, or one of the prime examples of this was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Sacred Heart uh, Primary School in, in Bridgeton and Glasgow, which I visited uh, early on in this, this whole exercise, um, where it was very clear that, that uh, let me get this right, I think French, German, Spanish and Italian yes. were all being used uh, at various points, not all by the same children, um, in the school day, but they were being incorporated into uh, into other work that, that the school was doing. And I think this is another conceptual leap we have to make, is that if you look at what happens uh, around all the other European countries that we always talk about being better at, at us at languages, the, the reason they're better at us than languages is they don't uh, sit and learn about languages, they use languages in school. And this is the crucial thing. Okay. Yeah, Jamie McGregor. Thank you. Um, during the evidence ses session, the committee has had concerns that children are going from primary to secondary schools uh, ha sometimes have difficulty in continuing the languages they've learned in primary, and resolving this must be one of the keys uh, to the Scottish Government's one plus two proposal. Um, now, the Scottish National <coughs> Centre for Languages research has highlighted that only a third of primary schools currently have a transition plan on languages with their secondary school. Um, so how can the continuity in language teaching be strengthened between primary and secondary schools? That's my first question. Well, I would certainly agree that uh, unless we, we crack that one, we, we won't solve the problem. I think that uh, uh, I think uh, everybody now acknowledges, and I think local authorities and schools acknowledge this, and they're getting better at solving the problem. Um, that there has to be some progression between primary and secondary. Uh, we've acknowledged that on a whole range of fronts. Um, uh, curricular uh, uh, thought has been given to this in a way that never used to be on, on all sorts of things. There was never any real consideration as to what happened uh, to, to people going from primary to secondary uh, on any front. But certainly on languages now, we do need, uh, I would agree, to make sure that uh, the knowledge that perhaps people have, have gained of a, of a language in, in primary school doesn't go to waste, as it were, uh, in secondary school. Uh, and for that reason, the, uh, the, the feeder schools, as it were, the clusters of schools that, that feed the secondary do have to and must cooperate. It will also require all sorts of thought to be given to, to workforce planning and other things as well. But uh, yes, uh, the, the working group was, was quite clear on this, that that problem does have to be solved and, and government and uh, local government have to work together to ensure that over the course of the coming years it is. I, I completely concede that. Well, would you think then that the government should have a national strategy, um, even though that national strategy might be managed at a local level, um, in order to provide that continuity? Because, I mean, otherwise you might get a situation where where parents of a child wanting their child to continue in a language might actually have to move from one area to another in order for that to happen. Yeah, I think that, I suppose the national strategy is firstly uh, curriculum for excellence and, and secondly uh, what we're doing just now in terms of a, a languages strategy. Uh, it does come, up to, come down to local authorities to make sure that it works because they are the education authorities, but uh, the, the two activities of government and their big activities I've mentioned uh, would certainly count, I think, in my view, as a, as a national strategy. Uh, I think that uh, you know, we, we do have to make sure that, that what, what children do in primary school counts for something in secondary. And with that in mind, uh, Education in Scotland is presently looking at the whole issue of progression uh, uh, to come forward with more detailed uh, thoughts, not just on how to ensure it happens, to, but to some extent to make sure it's measurable as well. And finally, Minister, well, uh, you talked earlier about companies who do business across the world. And um, I've seen a list of the la languages which seem to be most in demand, which I think are the top three are French, German and Spanish, and obviously Mandarin creeping up the scale. Um, now, do you, are you, with your national strategy, are you going to have a strategy that it looks at what sort of languages the pupils should be getting in this one plus two in order for them to be practical uh, for um, promoting Scottish business or trade 
uh, or, or generally, um, which, are, which are practically useful. And I'm not suggesting any languages are not practically useful. I know that the point of any language is, is good for children to learn. But, I mean, will there be a strategy on what sort of languages children should be learning in the schools? Well, I think that the point I made earlier about it being beneficial that we have a, a reasonably wide palette of, of languages available is based on the idea that we don't know where a child will, will end up in their life. I absolutely agree with the point you've made about some of the, the world languages that, that are important and are being taught increasingly in school. Um, Spanish is increasingly popular um, from a, a very small base. Chinese languages are beginning to be more popular in school and some effort is going into to all of these areas. Um, but I, the, the working group interestingly came forward with the, with the view that it didn't see a hierarchy uh, of languages in this, and I suppose partly that was to do with the fact that we, you know, we, we must work with what we have and, and the people we have uh, and the interests that people have. But I think also because uh, there was a recognition that um, having that wide choice of languages available in schools uh, across the country was, was more likely um, to engage the, the interest of young people. And to, to come back to, I think, something you alluded to yourself there, it is partially about attitude. It is partially about uh, ensuring that, that people have confidence about learning other languages. I mean, it may be that somebody in their career thinks back to what they did at school and the language they did in primary three or primary four. It may be that they do that. Uh, it may be, however, that they learn a completely different language. It may be that they learn a language their teachers have never thought of. But because, like most people in Europe, they've been exposed to language learning in primary, it, it comes as something quite natural to them and they're not embarrassed about trying. So I think these things are all significant. Well, can I have one last one? Um, there's obviously a difference between a large school in, a, in an urban area and, and rural primaries, which you'll know yourself, and rural secondaries from that point of view. Um, how would you bridge the gap, which is obviously going to appear where a very large school can, with, with better funding can, can have more teachers doing different languages, and smaller schools, which are going to be limited, uh, as far as I can see, uh, by having maybe you, you know, a limited amount. So, so you might get, as it were, different classes of schools in, as, as far as language learning is concerned. Is there any way you can bridge that gap? I appreciate the, the danger that you're pointing to there, although, as I say, in, in primaries, primarily the, the teaching of modern languages is anticipated is going to be something that's, that's done by classroom teachers. Um, so to some extent there's a level playing field there, but I fully appreciate that the complexities of, of what we, we ask of schools, what we ask of teachers, uh, means that uh, it's... There are particular challenges in, in rural areas or in small schools, and that's why, to some extent, there is, is cooperation between uh, schools on a number of these fronts. I don't know if somebody else wants to talk more about um, rural schools, which are, are going to be an issue in the coming days more generally. Well, the, 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 the point I would make is, is that in other European countries, there are small uh, rural schools, and they deliver young people with um, an ability to converse in other languages, an openness to, to converse in other languages. And going back to, to what the minister was saying about you know, the change of attitude and uh, the, 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 the transformational change in the approach to languages, this is the norm in other European languages, whether they're uh, uh, in urban schools or in, in small rural schools. And it's that kind of um, uh, change that we want to replicate here. And again, with, without the... Um Lib about this, uh, you know, but picking up on a, a point that, that Tim has just made there, um, you can see this rep replicated around Europe. But I remember, and I'm, everyone tires of me quoting this example, but I'll quote it again. I was in Luxembourg a few years ago and was astonished to find small uh, preschool units all advertising that they all operated in five languages Luxembourgish, German, French. The main, uh, main immigrant language, which was Portuguese and English. And if a, a small preschool unit of 40 kids can manage that, I'm not saying we can manage that tomorrow in Scotland, but it does indicate uh, that small schools as well as big schools are, are capable of, of doing good things in this area. But I don't underestimate the challenges, and, and they are. Thank you. Yeah, Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Allen, I think. Um, 
you know, the, the, the evidence about how important the, the capacity building of learning languages for young people is, is it has been well made and is well understood by the committee. Um, but we also had questions about, about the economic um, advantages um, and, and how um, the role of language can support economic development in Scotland. And some of the concerns that were raised is, is that the, the languages that we teach are, are, are based on tradition and it's a self-fulfilling tradition in that if you learn French and you learn German at school, you're likely to go on and study those and then, then the, the, the teachers that are available in those areas you know, um, are French and German teachers. And I just wondered if, if, if you had looked at working with academia, academia and business to really look at about how, as you described, the palette of languages can be expanded and ensure that we're meeting the, the economic um, demands of the country as we go forward. Well, that, that's an important point, and certainly um, it's interesting to see, uh, as I mentioned, the rise of, of Spanish, or the rising interest amongst young people in Spanish, and as I say, to some extent, uh, the welcome rise in interest in Chinese languages. Uh, yes, we do need to, to do more in, in this area, and I'm sure it's something we'll, we'll want to look at. Um, you also mentioned um, another significant point in there, which was, um, in the past, the assumption was that people who studied languages at school might be the kind of people who would study languages at university. Again, looking around uh, Europe, that assumption isn't there. Um, uh, there has been an assumption in the past that if you, if you were doing, for instance, if you were doing a language at university, you were essentially doing a literature course. You were essentially uh, le learning about the corpus, uh, the canon of, of poetry and, and prose in that, that language's literature. Um, now, that certainly has a very honourable place, but it's not what everybody who learns Italian wants to do. Um, and that's why we're, we're trying now as well, just this week, um, the government was launching uh, new awards in school, uh, Languages for Life and Work, which are designed for people who may not want to do a literature course in that language, who may not want to take that, that language to degree level, but might want to have sufficient fluency in that uh, language to go and work abroad for a year or for the rest of their lives. And uh, I think it's, it's that diversity as well that we need to encourage, not just the diversity of languages, but about the kind of courses we make available to, to people who might want a, an academic course or people who might, might want a very practical conversational course. Um, just a, a, a supplementary um, along this area is that um, we, we talked about how the community could become involved um, and uh, in schools and that's perhaps there's, there's a, already a model there for, for parents and, and groups being set up within the primary schools but the, there's also that the business communities in the area and some of the evidence that we, we showed said that there was quite a keen interest in businesses in the area actually becoming sort of champions for the schools. And I wondered if you'd looked at, at any way that this might be facilitated. Well, it's certainly interesting that the, the business community uh, seems to regard very positively um, what, what we're doing here. Um, the, the CBI, for instance, uh, has, has made positive comments uh, uh, about this. The, uh, talked about um, uh, it, how, it, how it, um, it will reverse the decline in the teaching of modern languages and it will be good for, for commerce. Uh, I certainly think as well at a local level um, there, are, there is a role for, for people to be invited uh, into schools. Uh, teachers will be in the classroom but people invited into schools uh, to talk about um, the role of language in business. In fact, I think there have been some uh, efforts in that direction already in some schools. Perhaps you're able to talk about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it was when Rebecca Trengove was giving evidence from Axion and she was talking about some very positive relationships that are formed in certain areas. And I think she said something um, struck me as quite relevant about how it, it very much depends on the nature of the local community and on the nature of local employers. And some local communities are very well placed. They've got a major employer where particular languages would be relevant. And I think that suggests itself absolutely to those authorities and schools in those areas to do that. Um, and certainly there's a lot of creativity, creative possibilities there and it absolutely ties in with uh, wider agendas around youth employment as well and about skills development of the young workforce. So I think it's certainly an area that we would expect to see, to see grow and we need to think about how we are part of that in, in, in promoting the one plus two strategy, I think, absolutely. Helen? 
supplementary. Um, I just convened, it's a supplementary to that, and uh, I mean, it's. I just wondered if you're aware of the work that um, Shell has done. If we're looking at parallels, um, Shell, in terms of the science work, uh, right across Fife, um, has introduced a science week in Fife, and it's usually about May time they do that, and they pay for children to be bussed into um, a central location, and they have all sorts of science projects, and it's at a place called St Colm House near Aberdour, and it's that kind of excitement that you maybe could try and generate from other big companies like you've mentioned, if we get them to help to, you know, celebrate this sort of work on an annual basis. But also there was a, a second point, if I may convene, and that was on the uh, creativity aspect of, of things. And I'm just wondering, you know, and Claire mentioned the point about capacity building, and I'm just wondering what kind of discussions are you having with other funders like the National Lottery and so on? Because one thing that quite excited me when we heard from witnesses was how um, through using uh, the IT equipment, you were able to get whole communities. Potentially, this was an idea that was coming through as they were speaking. I'm not sure they actually said that, but it was forming in my head, was you could get whole communities to link up with other communities abroad. <coughs> and um, you could use IT to do that, but somebody would need to fund it. So I'm thinking, I chair the Industrial Communities Alliance cross-party group and I was just thinking that some of the areas where they're suffering from you know need, needs for re regeneration uh, it might be very pertinent for them to be applying for funding to say the National Lottery to do links with that for you know grandparents parents children uh, linking up with other parts of the EU but it would need some kind of prod from Scottish Government to the lottery funders to get them to accept us as, as a possible kind of funding um, you know, possibility. So I only ask you to look at it, not to commit yourself to it, but to look at that. I certainly think it's interesting that it brings us back again to the, the issue that was raised a number of times about how do we engage wider communities and families in, in uh, uh, seeing this as an important transformation in schools. Uh, Obviously, uh, I can't speak for the National Lottery, um, but we, we would certainly obviously want to keep all options open. Uh, anything that we can uh, encourage within communities that encourages links with, with other countries and other languages and ties in with what their children are doing in school has to be obviously a positive thing. Okay. Okay. Just uh, another uh, anecdotal uh, um, a piece of evidence uh, for you, Minister, and maybe your comment on is yesterday I had the, the great privilege of being uh, in my constituency when the o Scottish Power opened the, the, one of their new offices. With potential, there's about 600 staff across the campus there, with potential for that to go up to 900. But I spoke to the education officers that are involved there and the recruitment officers, because one of the things that struck me was if the schools in Hamilton and across that area are teaching Spanish, and Iberdrola, who's a parent company, are looking for young people who speak Spanish because the, the employment opportunities are much wider for them then across their whole business. Um, so one of the things that I'm doing, and I think maybe a responsibility that we've got as well in, in our constituencies when we know that there is business champions, uh, or potential for business champions there, is how we do that. So uh, I've set up some meetings with some of the key people in Scottish Power based at, at the Hamilton campus and trying to tie them in with the local schools um, and, and doing that. And we, the, they've got a STEM officer as well, which is uh, obviously Willie really Coffee going to come with a very final question on you about, uh, about STEM. But they've got a STEM Office as well, so I'm hoping to tie all of these key people in together and then tie them up with the local schools um, so that they then have young people getting involved in energy sources, you know, and the science of that, but also young people thinking this could be a career path for me and a way to do that is to have Spanish as a language. Um, that, that was just a, a very uh, pertinent, up to date uh, um, experience that I've had. I think that probably reinforces the point why it's probably less, it's probably not useful for, for government in Scotland to decide on a short list of, of languages that must be taught everywhere. I think it, it, it probably proves the point uh, that whether it's community languages, traditional languages, uh, employers, local factors, uh, local authorities should be allowed a lot of discretion in this area uh, and that, that's a good thing. You're right at the time that, that you need to go, Minister, but we have a very quick final question for you, if you're OK to, to take that. Yeah, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much again, Convener. Uh, it was again, Minister, to invite you to look forward um, to the uh, future, and particularly with science and engineering students. And do we think that we're doing enough to, to encourage science and engineering students, particularly coming through university, to combine their studies with a language? 
Uh, when I was asking Robin Parker this uh, previous session how many graduates are coming out of Scottish universities in science and engineering with a language element somewhere, not necessarily to degree level, as you've mentioned yourself, but we weren't sure just what that position was. And really, do you think we should be doing more to encourage undergraduates to combine science and engineering with languages? And uh, how successful do you think we could be at doing that if we, if we think that's the right thing to do? I don't know the figures that you're looking for there. We can try and find it for you. Uh, in terms of what we can do to encourage, I think probably the biggest thing we can do to encourage uh, people to, uh, who are doing science uh, and other subjects to combine it with an outside course in, in languages uh, is to, to have that model in operation in schools so that somebody who is doing hires in physics and chemistry perhaps uh, may be doing a, a language for, for life and work type course uh, in Italian or German, uh, and that might lead them on to doing something similar in university. I think probably that's where it has to begin. Do you think the curriculum at school level is flexible enough, I know, to, to allow science students to combine with, with a, language, a modern language? Well, certainly, in, firstly, in terms of the, the new awards that, w that were launched uh, this week, uh, they definitely are. There, there's, there are awards that people might take in third year, they might take in fifth year. Uh, they can combine with, with certainly hires that have nothing to do with, with languages or literature, uh, and I would like to see that, that kind of flexibility introduced into uh, into our system, both in schools and in university. Can I thank you very much? We took you over your time, Minister, but we, I think we found that um, certainly very, very interesting for us. You've answered some of the, the, the key points on funding that I think that we needed to know as well. And I think notwithstanding some of the, the follow-up that I think our clerks will get in touch with your officials and, and do some of the follow-up, because I think that's very valuable for, for the outcome of our report. And can we thank you very much for your attendance at committee today and your evidence? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to suspend for five minutes just for a brief uh, comfort break. Um, so I'll be back um, in five minutes. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're moving on to agenda item four, which is Scottish Government's country plan for China and our international framework. And I believe we have some feedback from Helen Eady and Roddy Campbell, who've attended a visit to Todd and Duncan Limited Textiles Company in Kinross. So happy to just uh, take your feedback and your comments. Thanks very much. In first. <laughs> and then I was going to ask you to shine first. One of the major problems with this is it was quite a while ago that we did this visit and it's kind of sunk into the recesses. But um, my main impression was of a, of a company which had uh, kind of come back from the dead courtesy of now being owned by the Chinese, but that the Chinese management seemed somewhat distant, uh, which they kind of liked, I thought. And also that uh, because... Um, there was uh, cashmere being spun in China as well as obtaining um, uh, yarn from China. To some degree, they were in competition with uh, the firm that owed them, and they were kind of keen to keep some of their trade secrets as to how they did, uh, how they managed this process to themselves. So it was a kind of odd thing. And uh, the thing that came out strongest to me was that the position of thought that, in terms of competition, um, the Chinese were able to obtain uh, a 16% export, export re rebate, whereas Todd and Duncan were not able to facilitate themselves of any, any such rebate. So com in terms of competition, they were at a disadvantage. So in trying to um, sell um, the spun yarn on the market, they had to rely very much on their quality and expertise, and in particular, the kind of wide range of quite sophisticated colouring they put onto the uh, spun yarn. So we had the opportunity of seeing the process itself, which was quite impressive. Um, they export a lot of this yarn both to uh, uh, Italy, and they seem to have a fairly regular uh, uh, kind of overnight trips with the spun yarn down to, ha to Hoik there, so it seemed to work well. Um, but it's a, it's a kind of specialist business. It's a, a relatively small business, um, which seems to be working well. And obviously, we, we have to, uh, I suppose, take our hats off to the Chinese for rescuing what was a, a business which was in difficulties. Um, uh, and, and it's obviously a, a job, job market in Kinross. Um, that's probably the main points that I can recall that struck me. But Helen, you might want to carry on. Yes, I, I'd like to just, thanks, Roderick. I'd just like to revert back to the 16% rebate issue yeah. because I think it's a really important issue yeah. because under the World Trade Organization rules, um, these were meant to be reduced to nil. And that was a really important point. But in actual fact, these re rebates had actually increased at the time of the economic downturn. So that, in fact, has um, placed our Scottish um, companies at uh, a disadvantage. And I just wonder, um, you know, maybe it's something we could maybe write to uh, the appropriate minister to say we were very concerned about that and maybe it's something that they could uh, raise uh, with the Westminster government because I think somebody somewhere should be really shining a torch on this specific point because, you know, if what all trade organisations are rules that we should all be signed up to, then China should be party to that as well and apparently they seem to have agreed to it at some stage. Um, but, um, you know, it would seem that they haven't done so. So I think that's a really important uh, point as well. And the other uh, issue that struck me in that visit was uh, the issue uh, under the Scottish Government's Regional Selective Assistance Grants. Now, I, I know um, from my own uh, general knowledge that, you know, some of that is governed by European Union rules and, um, you know, guidelines. So there's maybe not a lot that the government can do. But... It did strike me um, that this particular company was competing against mainly Chinese or Italian-owned uh, textile firms, which have, have in fact benefited from this regional selective assistance. And our own Scottish Indigenous companies can't benefit in any shape or form. So there's, there's an issue there that we maybe need to just reflect upon in our report as well when we come to write that up. Um, because Todd and Duncan were saying quite clearly that they've never been able to qualify for any assistance from any of um, the government agencies um, due to the size of the company, its GDP and the number of staff that it employed. So maybe that's um, something that we can think of. 
and they did say that they had worked with the university on the issue of training, um, but that because of the resources issue for the company, they had to pull back from that. But one of the points that they highlighted to us was the relationship previously with the job centre, the way that it used to work, was very helpful to them because they were able to phone up <coughs> and get workers on tap almost immediately. But now, uh, with the remoteness of the job centres, that has really um, created uh, a, a loss of personal contact and understanding that the management uh, used to have. And they've really asked us uh, if we would um, consider some of these key factors uh, that they have to cope with in developing their work and also the fact that they would really like to have um, a much higher profile of their own label. And when I saw some of the products, you know, and, and they took us to a factory shop and anybody can visit the factory shop and you get, you know, good prices there. But it did strike me that it'd be really good if this company could develop its own uh, label uh, that would help to develop it as a, as, as a company um, of, of the Todd and Duncan label of origin. Um, and they think that that would help to strengthen its market hold. So... Um, and, and again, it raised the issue of language, which was the primary purpose of our visit. Um, it said that, um, you know, they, they really found it quite a disadvantage uh, to them uh, in not being able to uh, converse in uh, a variety of different languages, particularly Chinese, and that they had to rely upon um, local people to help them uh, in China. So it's a very worthwhile visit. It was, it's a very short visit in some ways, um, but uh, the, the management were very helpful and very forthcoming, and uh, I, I hope um, that arising from that, there's maybe some lessons that we can take forward and maybe help them in some way too. OK, thanks very much. Um, a lot of things there. I think a number of things we can raise with the minister when we've got the minister in front of us uh, and have them in the report. But, yeah, we should we should follow up all of these in the course of, of our evidence taken, I think. One of the things on the, the language learning, which is something that sprung to my mind, was that if Todd and Duncan are not currently a member of the Collective Learning Partnership, maybe we should encourage them to do that, because one of the things that they offer is a teaching of foreign languages to their staff. Um, you know, which uh, other companies I know have benefited greatly from that, um, Spanish being one of the languages that they learn. So maybe we can uh, get the contact details across to Todd and Duncan to allow to them to train their own staff and or the staff to get the training via the local college. Jimmy. Um, when you say that the, the, one of the things they want to do is to use their own label, what label do they use in the factory shop? Uh, and why can't they use the, the, the Todd and so, um, thingy label? Well, I think they use the Loch Leven label at the moment. Um, that was the impression I had. Um, and I think also the fact that they're selling the yarn back to the parent company in China. Um, I think the parent company in China then negotiates with uh, hand knitters and knitters and others right across um, their whole spectrum. And I think Italy is one of the places they source their knitted products but they also have them in Hoyk in the borders too, so it's really down to the parent but company if you go to, the to factory determine... Shop, you go to the factory shop, what... what it, it, just it was Loch Leven. Loch Leven. Yes, I think it was Loch Leven, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the stuff that's exported uh, indirectly, either from Hoyk or goes to Italy, is going to have uh, Hermes and, and Chanel labels on them. So, uh, so then the price... Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The prices were phenomenal. You were yeah. talking about... There was one uh, garment that I pointed to naively gave a price that I thought it was miles away from the market. It was a thousand dollars was the price of the product. It did look superb, but do you know, I mean another world altogether, isn't it, from Scotland, yes. Okay, we know all those uh, questions and we can take those forward in the course of our, our inquiry. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. I I think we are now on to the Brussels Bulletin, which, um, as I explained earlier, has been compiled by Scotland Europa. And um, I'm happy to, uh, if we can, any issues that you want to raise from that, um, we can take on board the new process of um, having the answers to those questions. Jamie. Well, I mean, again, this is a question nobody's going to be able to answer here. But the... The Spe Special Committee on Agriculture has formally confirmed the Council's negotiating position on the four-draft Common Agricultural Policy Reform Regulations. But 
If the math thing, I noticed that the EU budget, the European Commission has requested a further 11 two point billion for the EU budget, and that the MEPs are saying they're not going to finalise the math, uh, you know, the, 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 the math until this uh, this has been worked out. Um, how on earth can you get a, a, a budget for the CAP if you don't have a budget for the whole um, math? That's that's my question. And when will we ever get? Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, now uh, it was meant to be done in 2014. I think it's now going to 2015. I, I mean, obviously, people, you know, farmers <coughs> in Scotland are, are, are worried about this. I mean, I think uh, from. You know, my experience across this committee is that the, the previous year's budget is the one that would stand. If they can't agree a budget for the following years, it's whatever budget's sitting now that just carries on. Um, I think my question would be, why does the Commission want an additional £11.2 billion when there's this uh, extreme stress on, on the budget in the first place? So, um, right, Good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Helen? Um, so I was very interested in the item about banking sector reform and about the proposal coming from Aaron <coughs> McCarthy, which is uh, talking about uh, a draft non-legally binding report on reforms to the EU banking sector. But the bit that it really interested me in that was advocating mandatory separation of the bank's retail and investment activities. And I'm just wondering if we can maybe uh, through this new process, find out from whoever's going to advise us um, what the likelihood is of that actually becoming um, EU law, because I certainly would welcome that. I think that would be a step in the right direction. Um, but i wondering what the political realities of it becoming a reality. OK, OK. Just, just on the new process, I thought, well, is someone taking some note of the questions and we can get them to Scotland, Europe? Yes. But yeah. yeah. Okay, anyone? Willie? Yeah, it's called not just gangsters now, but banksters. <laughs> so. You can see the connotation in there. Thanks. <laughs> Probably best not to comment. <laughs> Willie? Thanks, Kavira. Uh, is it possible to, to push a few questions on in, in the hope that we can get some answers at a later stage? The questions, and, and I think the could, clerks can I don't ask expect them all Scotland, today. Europe. Yeah. We're, we're get <laughs> Again, the first uh, issue was on the broadband. The, subject that we've covered a, a few times at the committee on page, on page 10, convener. I note that uh, proposal to, to, with the aim of cutting by 30% the cost of rolling out high-speed internet. Now that, I, I don't know what I take from that. Does that mean a, a budget cut or is it an, a, a, an intention to try to reduce the, the charges for bringing high-speed internet in across the European Union? I'm not quite sure what that means, to be honest, but I think it sounds encouraging. <laughs> But I'm not sure. We, we do know from a previous report, uh, Brussels report here, that there was quite a substantial cut in one of the budgets that was going to help this kind of infrastructure throughout the European Union, and that was worrying to some of the members of the committee. So any kind of follow-up information in that area would be very welcome, convener. Could, could, could I say something about the Serbia and Kosovo yes. uh, situation that's, that's mentioned in page 11 there? That, this, this must be uh, one of the most depressing um, stories to continue to read uh, and I think the deadline has now passed, the European Union deadline passed a couple of days ago to try to encourage Serbia and Kosovo to reach some kind of a, a accommodation and agreement about the the way forward. Um, what, what I find really disappointing about it is that I mean, I mean, Kosovo has now been recognised by nearly 100 members of the United Nations and 22 out of the 27 European Union members and, and, and a high number of the NATO members, but they still face this difficulty with their neighbour in Serbia to try to reach a resolution. And, and I know it's easy and glib for me to suggest that they should get on with it and, and do that, but I, I, I feel really bitterly disappointed and, and, and worried about the, the, the future. We know that Serbia's accession process is, a, is ahead of Kosovo's, and I think clearly minds in the European Union must be, be wondering what on earth to do about this, whether they proceed with the process with Serbia in the absence of an agreement with Kosovo. I don't think that can can happen because the, the European Union policy chief, Catherine Ashton, Ashton, I think her name is, has already said that they're unwilling to do that and import another frozen um, uh, difficulty in the way that we did with Cyprus 
which is it was even was still a divided community. So I don't think there's an appetite within the European Union to to do this while the dispute continues between Serbia and Kosovo. I think Scotland has a good relationship with both. We've had visitors from both countries here and a particularly warm relationship. And my, my heart, I think, goes out to both countries in, in the, the real hope that, that they can achieve a, a, a solution and that, that Kosovo can ultimately get the recognition that it, that it deserves and that has been recognised worldwide, convener. Very much, Roddy. Yeah, no, I just wanted to make a comment rather than a question. I was interested in the comment on page 11 about human rights and as to the possibility of uh, the EU joining the European Convention on Human Rights in its own right, which will require the unanimous uh, approval of EU member states in the light of uh, the current Conservative parties uh, seeming rather uh, hostility towards the European Convention and possible withdrawal. I, wondered what the UK government's position was likely to be on this issue. That was one in mind as well. Helen. Yes, I'd just like to come in and support what Willie uh, Coffey said about the broadband issues. I am absolutely, absolutely at one with him on that. And I mean, I think up until the end of April or the end of March there, we had something like £28 billion pounds <coughs> were at our disposal <coughs> across the EU and, uh, you know, for developing broadband. And I just wonder <laughs> at that EU level just how much of that £28 billion was actually spent. And I would be interested to know uh, from EU Commission officials exactly you know, how much was spent, and maybe our, um, you know, people in uh, Brussels could t give us that answer. And also just to say that, I mean, I had the, um, the, the good fortune to visit uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia and Croatia and Hungary during the Easter break. And certainly when I was speaking to the locals in uh, Serbia, um, they were very keen, uh, by and large, to join the EU. Um, and like you say, we did have the Serbians visit here in the Scottish Parliament and they too were very keen. But I think as long as this dispute is continuing between Kosovo and Serbia, um, I think it could be some time before they get um, you know, any development on that. But it would be good to hear if any of our um, officials have intelligence on that in Brussels as to what the position is since the 16th of April, as, as Willie has said, because it's, uh, I think, in all of our interests, um, you know, to find out uh, what's happening in countries like that. And certainly that part of uh, Eastern Europe, I think it's got the most amazing architecture and certainly worth visits. And my favourite is Budapest, but I have to say there's really, really worrying Inter, um, political concerns going on in Hungary at the moment and I just wonder if other colleagues around the table share those concerns and that maybe we could have a briefing on that in due course because certainly democracy there does seem to be breaking down very seriously. Chair, um, Edith's comments are, 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 are very important. Uh, we've seen democracy break down in Greece and, and Turkey, uh, Italy and other places where We've had uh, non-elected presidents and governments in place and, and very mature democracies. So there is a very serious um, uh, shortfall of democracy across Europe just now. Um, Serbs have historically not had a very good rapport with its neighbours. And therefore, I think it's important that agreements are reached before Serbs, Serbia is considered to be uh, part of uh, the uh, European Union. I think that you cannot bully your way onto a table and, and bully your way into nationhood. It needs to be with consensus and it needs to be with peaceful means and it needs to be democratically uh, approved. And therefore, um, I'm disappointed that they have not been able to come to an agreement. Um, and whilst we in the Scottish Parliament don't have jurisdiction over how that happens, but we can certainly share our concerns, uh, and I think that um, perhaps um, we should be looking at um, making some sort of representation uh, to the UK government to try and encourage them to try and help broker peace across Europe because the European Union is going to be a very dangerous place to live in if we can't achieve peace uh, at this day and stage. I mean, we've had huge numbers of human life loss in the, in the heart of Europe. We cannot allow that to happen again. And therefore, I think it's, it's, it's a very important issue, this. And I think 
we really need to encourage our government to, to take some very serious steps and try to encourage and support a peaceful resolution in that part of the world. Yeah, I think a breakdown in democracies is, is, is yeah. dangerous for us all. Body. Uh, one other matter I just wanted to raise, I was uh, quite interested in the, the reference to the environment impact assessments in a recent European Court of Justice ruling that member states uh, can't just uh, place a quantitative size threshold to decide what projects need an assessment now being based on potential environmental impact. I just wondered, or makes an inquiry as to, to what the Scottish Government would be doing in the light of this court ruling. Maybe it's something obviously I could raise in uh, as a written question or otherwise to the government, but if there's any other information that uh, would be forthcoming, just amplifying this little paragraph, it would be helpful. Okay. Claire Adamson. Yeah, um, thank you, Kimberly. It was just in, in relation to actually page two and, and the information about Portugal, when it mentions that a court ruling has deleted 1.3 billion um, from the steady measures. I wasn't sure if that was a, a, a court ruling internal to Portugal well, it was actually the European Union that had taken that um, decision. It was quite interesting, but obviously um, in complete sympathy with, with Portugal who are who's struggling um, under austerity at the moment, um, it's very worrying that the, there'll be further cuts to spending in health, education, social security in that country, which is obviously suffering really badly with crippling levels of youth unemployment at the moment. Okay, Willie. I think it's uh, internal Portuguese courts that have declared some of these cuts as unconstitutional and perhaps somebody should have thought of that before they proposed the cuts. But that's, that's another story. It was just, just to follow up on this earlier Kosovo issue there, Kinder, I mean, the progress towards any reconciliation is, is inevitably painful, but it's, it's no half as painful as the, the, the alternatives and the, and the place that both countries have come from. <coughs> I, I, would, I would really welcome even a briefing of some kind to the committee about what's happened and happening there. Uh, I know we've, we've all got European Union members in the European Parliament and I'm not quite sure who would be the most appropriate to give us or send us a briefing convener, but I would really appreciate that before we perhaps then made some kind of submission to, to ask for help, and yeah. to offer our help and support. I would certainly support that convener. Yeah, I think that's a good move to do that. Thank you. Anything, anything that we can do to forge closer links, you know, not that we could be helpful directly, but perhaps indirectly that we can influence things. Yes. Okay, just a couple of things that I, I wanted to pick up. I think we should take cognizance of the, the, the issue around about structural funds and the fact that we managed to negotiate a better settlement for Scotland than we anticipated. That was a bit scary for a while. Um, the other thing is the, the issue on international students and researchers. The Commission proposing new rules to make it easier uh, uh, for international students and researchers to live and work in the EU. I think that will be everywhere else in the U EU apart from the UK, because we know the pressures that have been on our, our colleges and universities and business. And I think that's something we should raise with Scotland to Europa directly as well, um, and certainly something we should raise with the UK government. Uh, you know, if the EU are coming up with, with, with rules to make this easier, but uh, in, in contrast, the UK government are tightening the rules and make, making it much more difficult, then that, that has an impact on us all. The other thing that I picked up on is the European Employment, uh, the European Commission's most recent uh, employment and social situation quarterly review. I think, um, again, is something maybe it, it's worth uh, having some sort of a briefing on and as to where that's going and how that will impact on um, uh, uh, other other countries, specifically within the EU. The other thing is when we uh, uh, recommend this report uh, at the end of the session to other committees is to, to make the Education Committee aware of the international students and researchers uh, situation, but also the situation about Horizon 2020 in Scotland and how, how we're dealing with that. I think finally, and we're trying to get in, Helen, Finally, back, backing up all the, the comments on Kosovo, and certainly I had highlighted the human rights issue as well, because I felt um, the EU, again, as same as the international students and researchers, taking a step forward and, and, and the UK government taking a, a step back. Um, I think that has to be highlighted. Helen. Yes, my other question was on page nine, which was on the venture capital and social entrepreneurship funds. Um, given that you know the social enterprise is a big issue for all parties in the Scottish Parliament, um, I just wonder if we could have a wee bit more briefing on that because you know for me um, you know it's very technical what's stated there, and I just wonder what the implications will be for our social enterprise in Scotland in 
with what is stated and um, you know I, I go to Council of Europe meetings um, but I haven't seen this on any of the agendas there and I just wonder um, what it actually means in reality for people so if someone could get us some more explanation to that it would be helpful. Okay, are members content to send the Brussels Bulletin to the committees for highlighting the points? Yeah. Can I take this opportunity at this point to commend Scotland Europa for doing a great job? I think it's a, mm -hmm. a really detailed and, and, and uh, uh, very well uh, drafted uh, uh, Brussels Bulletin. I think we should uh, extend our thanks to, to Scotland Europa for that. I think Jim's going to come in to give you a wee uh, uh, update on where we go next with this. I think that conversation we've just had in the Brussels Bulletin demonstrates quite clearly you know, the, the need for a European officer on the committee to answer some of these questions directly because what you've got now is Spice and, and, and the clerks doing a lot of running about to find information and briefings whereas we could have had immediate answers to the questions. But I think Jim's going to tell you what happens next with how we get answers to some of the questions. Jim. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. It's just helpful to just clarify the process. So well, the, the clerk's office took a, took a list of uh, the questions that you had and we will now forward those on to Scotland Europa in Brussels with a copy of the official report for the meeting as well uh, and ask them to get as much of the, the briefing as you've requested and hopefully we'll get that for you for the, for the next committee. But obviously, if that's not possible, we'll get it as soon as, as, soon as we can there, thereafter. Okay, members content with that? Yeah. Okay, as agreed at the beginning of the meeting, agenda item six will be taken in private, so if we just take a few minutes for um, uh, broadcasting and our fast members of the public, thank you for coming. <laughs>